Welcome to day two of the inaugural California Digital Humanities Research Institute, or Cali DHRI. I am Tatiana Bryans, co-director of Cali DHRI and research librarian for digital humanities, history, and African-American studies at UC Irvine. I'd like to start with a land and labor acknowledgement. Higher education institutions, settlers, and guests exist on the traditional, occupied, or unceded territories of hundreds of tribes across what is currently known as the state of California. This land has been stewarded by indigenous people since time immemorial, in spite of forced removal and assimilation policies, as well as oppressive systems and structures that continue to perpetuate their erasure. We also want to acknowledge the long history of colonization, slavery, forced migrations, coerced labor, exclusion, and racism experienced by indigenous and black communities across California and the US. We invite you to learn more about this history and consider how you can materially support disenfranchised communities. Cali DHRI is a new annual digital studies, digital ethics studies institute inspired by CUNY Digital Humanities Research Institute and hosted by UC Irvine Libraries and UCLA Libraries. We are sponsored by UCLA's Digital Humanities Program, the Center for the Study of Women, the Streisand Center, and, off, and the Office of Advanced Research Computing, as well as the USC Mellon Humanities and the Digital World Program. I really wanna take the time now to um, thank all of the team that helped put this institute together, um, starting with Cali DHRI co-director and UCLA librarian for digital research and scholarship, Zoe Borofsky, as well as all of our instructors. Yo Kawano is the lead computation scientist for GIS and spatial data science for the Office of Advanced Research Computing at UCLA. Eleanor Cole is the senior program manager for research facilitation and the Office of Advanced Research Computing at UCLA. Andy Wukowski is a visualization librarian at USC Libraries. Joy Gui is the Emerging Technologies Advocate at the Social Sciences Center for Education Research and Technology at UCLA. Nick Schweiderman is a PhD student in Information Studies at UCLA. Winnie Kurtz is a lecturer and project scientist with the program in Digital Humanities at UCLA. Sam Carter is a PhD candidate in Visual Studies at UC Irvine. Stacey Williams is a librarian for the Ralph J. Bunch Center for African-American Studies. Stacey Shin is a PhD student in English at UCLA. Justin Wittell is a PhD candidate in English at UCLA. And Pradeep Cannon is a PhD student in musicology at UCLA. This year, Kelly DHRI centers Black Digital Humanities. Our 2022 theme, the Black Press, will be explored by three keynote speakers over three days, who will each highlight their own Black Digital Humanities research and projects. Feel free to add any questions and comments for our, for our keynote speaker to the Q&A function at any point during this morning's keynote. Um, and next, I want to introduce today's keynote speaker, Angela LeBlanc Ernest. Her work focuses on American history post-1965 with an emphasis on the modern Black freedom struggle. She's a graduate of Harvard University with a BA in Afro-American Studies and graduated from Stanford University with an MA in American History. She's also an inaugural Oral History Association NEH Fellow. The founding director of the Black Panther Party Research Project at Stanford, her work on the party's history includes the study of women, the impact of gender in the party, and the organization's community survival programs. She has published peer review articles and book chapters, as well as public facing articles and digital projects. Her publications have appeared in anthologies, academic journals, blogs, and encyclopedias, as well as popular venues, such as Color Lines, Vibe, and the Black Youth Project. LeBlanc Ernest is the director of the OCS Project LLC, created to recover and preserve the Black Panther Party's Oakland Community School history and foster curriculum-based projects and community-based conversations about the Black Panther Party's Oakland Community School. She's also a co-founder of the Intersectional Black Panther Party History Project, a collective of four historians and filmmakers committed to the recovery and restoration of the party's history and women's critical roles in the organization. Currently, she's producing and directing a documentary film about the Oakland Community School, one of the party's longest lasting community survival programs, and a community partner with and co-leader of the Black Panther Party Oakland Community School, 
Community Archives, Activism, and Storytelling Research Cluster at UC Irvine. Her talk today is titled Digitizing Memory, the Black Panther Oakland Community School Yearbook Project. Angela, feel free to begin whenever you're ready. Hello everyone. Thank you, Tatiana, so much for that introduction. And um, thank you to everybody on the organizing team for creating this space, but also for inviting me to present. And I also want to thank everyone in attendance. As an independent scholar and community-based scholar, I am always grateful when anyone holds space for any aspect of my research and my project. So thank you again. I'm excited about this opportunity to share the history of the Oakland Community School Project, um, which I refer to usually as shorthand, the OCS project, and to introduce you to the ways in which I've worked to design digital projects that are intentionally public facing and designed for use by both non-academic and academic communities. But first, I'd like to begin by passing the mic to the people who know more about the OCS experience than I can hope to know. I'm about to share a six minute video that I edited and I call it Reasons to Know. Um, it's a clip that's compiled of interview snippets um, with former OCS teachers, students, parents, family members, party members, who are sharing reasons they believe people should know about the Black Panther Party's Oakland Community School. I'll let them begin the story since they lived the history and then transition to my work, which I see as a bridge between then and now. Uh, and Tatiana, this is where we would So moving on to slide three, I thought I would just give you a little background about myself. I am a New Orleans, Louisiana native, although I do take pride in uh, doing my preschool education in Long Beach, California, one of my first, one of my earliest education memories. Uh, I attended public schools for K through 12 and then private schools for college and graduate school, majoring, as Tatiana said, in African-American studies at Harvard and history at Stanford. My archival experience is varied. In addition to using archives for academic research, I worked at the Amistad Research Center at Tulane University as an assistant archivist the summer before my senior year of college. And then during my years at Stanford, I was both a research intern at the Martin Luther King Jr. Papers Project, and then I became the founding director of the Black Panther Party Research Project under the umbrella of the King Papers Project. Since 2000, I've been an independent scholar and project director. 2016, I co-founded the Intersectional Black Panther Party Research Project with my three fellow historians of BPP Women's History. And uh, IPHP is a hybrid digital humanities and traditional academic project. And then in 2017, I began laying the groundwork for the OCS project. Um, slide four, how did I get here? The OCS project is one of the outgrowths of my research on women in the Black Panther Party that I began as an undergraduate. That work based on women's narratives expanded to include, the, to include the Black Panther Party's community survival programs while I was in graduate school. In fact, my master's thesis was on the Oakland Community School, which was one of the Black Panther Party's longest running survival programs spanning 11 years. I gravitated to OCS because I wanted to explore in depth one of the programs the party created to implement point five of its 10 point platform and program. On the, next on the next slide, you'll see the first five points of the platform. Uh, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense co-founded in October 1966 by the late Dr. Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale in Oakland, California, has a larger than life quality that often causes us to lose sight of the party members and their own humanity and the efforts to attend to people's basic needs. Both the stigmatization and the romanticization of their boldness, their courage, and their bravery has overshadowed the basic human rights that they espoused in their 10-point platform and program and implemented through their more than 60 community survival programs. Continuing on to the next slide, 
the organization's 10 point platform and program, its charter document summarized its mission in the last point. We want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace and people's control of modern technology. On slide seven, you'll specifically see point five and it's called for quote, education that exposes the true nature of this decadent American society. We want education that teaches us our true history and our role in the present day society. Indeed, education was at the heart of everything the party did. They believed in educating yourself with your history and your rights. Party members were expected to read and learn from political books for the party's political education classes. They took opportunities to educate the community about issues directly affecting them and how to affect change. The party was deeply involved in the Black Student Associations at Laney College and Merritt College and organized on local campuses around issues relevant to student needs, such as childcare. The average age of party members was 19 in the earliest years. However, as party members with children started relocating to the Bay Area from the more than 40 national chapter and branch offices, and as party members started having children in increasing numbers, they realized the need to create an educational space for children to receive the type of education many party members had not received as children themselves. Next slide. In 1971, the party started the Intercommunal Youth Institute for Black Panther Party members' children only. The Child Development Center was for the youngest of them. By fall 1973, the institute had moved to a permanent location at 6118 East 14th Street in East Oakland and was operated by the newly created nonprofit Educational Opportunities Corporation. Unlike its first iteration, the school now at this new location officially opened to the larger community and eventually changed its name to the Oakland Community School. There were some distinct differences between educational experiences of students who attended the Youth Institute beginning in 1971 and those who attended after 1971. I'm, I'm sorry, those who attended after 1973, because the Institute evolved with time. Once the school opened to the broader community, they accepted children ages two and a half years to 11. The student to teacher ratio remained small with no more than 150 students enrolled during an academic year. There were no grades, only levels, and students were taught and placed in levels according to their ability, not their age. Next slide. Charting the history of the Oakland Community School is a major key to understanding the Black Panther Party as an organization, as well as a window into an alternative small school education model that highlighted, highlighted and addressed critical educational needs then and now. There's a scholarly interest and increasing public interest in radical education, liberatory education, freedom schools and maroon learning. And I believe OCS history can contribute to all of those conversations. One of the school's mottos was the world is a child's classroom. The school graphic on the blue cover embodies this. It was drawn by M. Gail Asali Dixon, a party member and graphic artist for the Black Panther newspaper, who also taught art at the school in the mid 1970s. The children were exposed to the world both inside and outside the classroom, within and away from the brick and mortar building. Learning experiences were everywhere and they were encouraged to and expected to explore. The next slide. Hundreds of students attended OCS between 1973 and 1982. Although the research continues to attempt to ident identify all students, after years of research and archival work, I finally determined there were 70 official graduates. Graduation in public school terms would have meant that the students were graduating the equivalent of fifth grade. The reality is that students who left and tested into other schools often tested two to three grades ahead of their peers and parents were faced with the decision about whether they would enroll them in the higher grade or not. 
Even though only 70 students officially graduated, the experiences of the hundreds of others who attended, as well as the experiences of those educators and support staff and parents throughout the school's 11 year history are all important and worth uncovering and preserving. Next slide. In addition to traditional academic subjects and the performing arts, students learned martial arts, practiced yoga and meditation, and had a peer-based justice committee for resolving issues. The children were provided after-school clubs as well. Their field trips included camping in local forests, visiting museums, touring science labs at UC Berkeley, and competing against students from other schools in music and martial arts and walking away winners. Next slide. I conceived of the yearbook project a, a few years ago as a digital humanities project, a way to create an official record of the school's history and as a networking tool for former students and current and future researchers. Starting with the 70 graduates, the goal and challenge is to locate as many of them as possible and record their personal OCS histories. I already know that some are deceased, so there continues to be an urgency of the moment for me to locate and preserve those stories. This requires much detective work as well as archival searches for photos and any types of documents that would confirm attendance, including social media as a source, in addition to old fashioned networking. To this end, I'll spend the next 12 months as an Oral History Association NEH fellow working on the Oakland Community School Oral History Project. Next slide. Seven months after the party's founding and implementation of armed community police patrols, I'll pause here, Tatiana, we don't need to play that video just for you to know. Seven years after the party's founding and implementation of armed community police patrols, several Black Panther Party members went to the California legislature in Sacramento to protest the Mulford Act, a proposal to make carrying weapons illegal in California. The Panthers in California were able to conduct their armed community police patrols precisely because there was no law against carrying an openly visible weapon. That Capitol visit jettisoned the party's image into print and television media around the world. But equally of interest to me was exploring the factors that led to the second visit to the California state legislature 10 years later and how the media covered this second visit much less than the first. I wanted to know the pressing educational issues that propelled OCS forward to reach commendation level four years after opening to the community and how OCS engaged other educators and education systems locally, nationally, and internationally. And finally, whether the press covered this visit in the same way that they covered the 1967 visit. So moving from that slide, how did I move from an OCS article with Erica Huggins in 2009 to a complete digital humanities project? In 2016, I shared an idea with Erica Huggins about filming new interviews with Black Panther Party women to complement interviews I already had for a documentary film about women in the party. Erica Huggins suggested I consider doing a quote, smaller project, a documentary on the Oakland Community School. By 2017, I had expanded the vision to include an archival documentary component, utilizing a digital platform to complement the documentary film when it's released. I could not imagine leaving so much material on the proverbial cutting room floor or not having use for the majority of the filmed interviews and other supporting documents and images. That's how the OCS project evolved. Moving forward, the OCS project byline is curating, creating, collaborating. Those three C's are the umbrella for the entire DH project and include archival work, storytelling, oral history, publications, and academic and community conversations around education issues. Ideally, I wanted to 
to create a platform that serves several purposes. One, brings visibility to the students, parents, staff, and community members involved with the school. Two, delivers the information in a format familiar to most people to the extent that most of us have attended a school at some point that had a class yearbook. Three, add a twist to the yearbook concept because OCS wasn't a traditional school and their memory books were not the traditional yearbooks with images of everyone who attended the school. Four, I wanted to create a platform with resources that are accessible to the general public. My experience as an academic researcher, as well as having been involved with the material in the Dr. Huey P. Newton records at Stanford, raised a lot of accessibility issues for party members themselves who found it difficult to afford to travel there, the cost of re reproducing material about their lives, um, et cetera. And the pandemic has only added yet another level of accessibility issues. And finally, I wanted to create a space to serve as a resource for former students, staff, and family to reunite. This component is an outgrowth of my ongoing OCS documentary film interviews. During my oral interviews, I realized that OCS was family in so many ways for different people. And they often became excited to know that I was in touch with certain people who were special to them. So continuing to the next slide, this word map is the result of plugging in words from 50 interviewees. In response to a direct question, they shared with me words that described their OCS experiences. I wanted to see which words were most repeated. In the end, I realized that any OCS project should account for these perspectives. The next slide. Several factors make my digital projects possible. My commitment to making marginalized and hidden stories visible, advancements in digital technology, the increasing number of Black Panther Party participants who've become older and want to tell their stories and manuscript and photographic collections becoming available. Also, my commitment to intellectual and public history projects and collaborative and collective work has influenced the formats, the projects I have chosen to undertake. Developing platforms that have visual elements also seems like a logical approach to archiving party history and storytelling because the Black Panther Party was a very visual organization. So now I move on to talk of, talking about the challenge of doing Black Panther Party and OCS research. The next slide. The challenge, of course, from the 1990s to now has been finding sources. From the time I began my research on women in the party, there were few primary sources. There were a couple published autobiographies by Asada Shakur and Angela Davis, and mainstream magazine and newspaper coverage of leaders such as Kathleen Cleaver and Elaine Brown. So the Black Panther newspaper became a primary source to find non-Black Panther Party leaders and women's faces and voices. And oral interviews became my second main primary source. Most of my interviews were via networking and building trust. A few were the equivalent of cold calls. My project on OCS has evolved over time, and this is the case with the resources. I promised myself when I graduated college in 1992 that if I continued the work on women in the party, that I would do my best to make women's stories and sources more accessible so no one would have to spend as much time locating primary sources as I and others who were boots on the ground in the earliest days of um, Panther women's research, where we spent so much time in library stacks, card catalogs, microfilm, microfiche rooms. Technology has helped tremendously in locating newspaper and now video sources. Moving on, my Black Panther Party research started with the Black press. I had an undergraduate advisor who had worked on the Henry Hampton Eyes on the Prize reader that accompanied the documentary film series about the civil rights movement. And my advisor's research focus was post-1945 African-American freedom struggle history. So he was able to point me in the exact direction I needed to go to, the be to begin my research on the party. 
In addition to traditional sources like the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, San Francisco Chronicle, I was also doing research in the Amsterdam News, The Sun Reporter, Jet, Ebony, and Sage magazines, to name a few. Now I'd like to show you uh, the first issue of the Black Panther newspaper. The Black Panther newspaper actually started as a four page flyer in 1967 and evolved into a 28 page news publication with international distribution. The last issue was printed in September, 1980. At the height of its circulation, the Black Panther newspaper itself reached a weekly circulation of more than 300,000. It was a full-time operation like most of the other community programs and the party itself. It sold for 25 cents and every Panther was required to read and study it before selling it. Each party member also was allowed to keep 10 cents of each sale to go towards their own living expenses, if you can imagine that. Between 1968 and 1972, it was the most widely read black newspaper in the US. There were distribution centers across the US. While the main one was San Francisco, there was also New York, Chicago, Kansas, Los Angeles, and Seattle. The newspaper grew its own team of artists, photographers, editors, and printers. Next slide. While I was able to find additional news and print sources outside of the party paper about women in the party, when I started my Oakland Community School research, I had a more difficult experience. For years, I relied only on the Black Panther newspaper because the Black Panther Party editorial staff intentionally included articles about youth, education, Black and poor people's experiences in the school system. They were young themselves. Unfortunately, there still is no index to the Black Panther newspaper, which has made locating the articles time consuming. Additionally, no one collection contains all the newspaper editions. And that's where the detective work comes in. The Black Panther newspaper, however, has the most consistent coverage of OCS. Their cover stories and stories about performances, graduations, and special events. Additionally, when searching the newspaper for school stories, you have to look for photos, insets, text-only articles, and photo collages on the back of the newspaper that might not have text narrative attached. As an, import, and as an important aside, I also want to mention that my research relies on the Black printing press. Emery Douglas was the lead graphic artist for the Black Panther Party. He also had his own printing company and party members who learned newspaper skills, newspaper print skills, designed and created flyers and the souvenir books that I use as part of the OCS project. Additionally, before the party newspaper shifted its emphasis from graphic art to photography, Emory and other artists such as J. Tarika Lewis, M. Gail Asali Dixon, and Malik Edwards created many of the images of the children. Between 1969 and 73, Stephen Shanes, a white UC Berkeley undergrad student, became a primary photographer for the party. It's likely his photos that you've seen of the children in berets and the children marching, as well as scenes of the children in the home-based iteration of OCS. These were from the first two years. During 1972, the party formally began developing its own cadre of photographers to capture the images of their daily lives and the communities surrounding them. The names you might not you might never hear, but whose work appear in the party's newspapers, newsletters, flyers, and other sources are Lauren Jackson, John Bunchy Creer, Melanie Williams, Dale Rasco, and Donald Cunningham. It is on their shoulders that much of the OCS project's work stands. <clears throat> Excuse me, so now I'll move to the next slide. And this is where I share a little bit about the beginning of the framework for the OCS Digital Yearbook Project. So, so I'm going to, um, in the chat, I'm gonna drop um, an Adobe XC link and it's just, it's nothing complex. It's super simple, but I just wanted to give you the opportunity to see the images closer up. This is the first year 
working on the prototype and it hasn't even been a full year yet. And that has been made possible because of material that's recently become available starting during the pandemic actually. Please understand that this demo reflects a project, I repeat, in progress, and it looked differently as recently as last night. I can't emphasize enough the in progress part. I wanted something to give you a bit of interaction. As a brand, I wanted a font that could be reflective of childhood and primary education because the OCS was the equivalent of pre-K through fifth grade. The OCS project logo was already created, so I wanted to make sure the colors in the yearbook match the logo colors. The cupcake font feels fun and childlike. The red, blue, and green traditionally are associated with elementary level education. Two of them are primary colors. The image was captured by the first image you saw uh, when you logged in and that's still on my screen, was captured by BPP photographer Donald Cunningham. And I like this particular image because it centers the children at work learning, but it also feels reminiscent of a photo by Black photographer Gordon Parks. That's how I felt it when I saw it. Although you can't see it in the demo, on the demo, I decided to divide the yearbook project by years to mimic an academic school year OCS also hosted a summer program for students. So my academic year divisions are September of the beginning of the school year through August of the following year. Unlike traditional public school, summer school at OCS was filled with enrichment activities and was not intended to make up any work or as remediation for grade level promotion. Tatiana, can you move to the next slide? A bit about the yearbook concept. OCS published two things, memory books and graduation souvenir books. The, the several memory books are not on this demo site. They are closest to what we think of as yearbooks. I say closest because they only contain class photos and candid photos from the school year. There was never an OCS publication with individual photos of students and staff and categories of most likely to succeed, the things that we would normally associate with the yearbook. And that's what makes this research so interesting and so um, fatiguing sometimes. Souvenir books are specific to graduation. The current collection of souvenir books is incomplete. We're adding and updating as we find them. These are from the Erica Huggins collection. A parent had saved them and shared them with her decades later. The simplest the simplistic layout is reflective of the basic design and technology available then. They include pictures of the graduates only and fundraising ads and congratulatory wishes, as well as the program order for the graduation service itself. Tatiana, next slide, please. The graduation souvenir books are useful in a variety of ways. They help me identify OCS students, parents, and staff, and the ads will help me understand community. While ad buys are the traditional approach to raise money to pay for souvenir books and other graduation expenses, the ads also reflect community support, especially for an institution like OCS. Ideally, having all the, the souvenir books allows me to track patterns of community support, revealing consistency or shifts over time. Additionally, the complete set would flesh out the history of the 70 graduates by providing photos of the students and information about family members and staff that can be attached to the 70 names I already have. The next slide. Um, while souvenir books provide, uh, oh, Tatiana, can you go back? I'm sorry. I thought there was a slide in there that's, that's not there. While souvenir books provide a variety of information about the Oakland Community School as an institution, the souvenir book covers also are works of art. At least two Black Panther Party graphic artists drew the covers for the OCS souvenir books, M. Gail Asali Dixon and Ralph Moore. Over time, I suspected the souvenir cover images were of OCS students and only within the past six months have I discovered that the cover art is in fact based on photographs taken by a BPP photographer. As new photos come available out of private collections, 
that people share with me. I compare them to the souvenir book covers in hopes of being able to, to match the original photo with the book cover. <clears throat> we can move forward now, Tatiana, thanks. Tools I am incorporating on the sites are timeline chronology, mapping, audio visual, and music. The timeline tool and mapping tools have been the most challenging. This is a gift, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the gift for demo purposes only. I struggle between whether I want to have a static timeline or an animated timeline. And I came down on the side of animated because I like the way it guides the eye across the screen and interrupts our traditional way of reading information on the screen. I mentioned that to um, Jade LeBlanc Ernest who actually helps with my design for um, the website. I mentioned to her um, that I wanted an animated timeline and she was actually inspired to create this timeline, which is based on the 2020 Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance. She saw this type of timeline and um, created something similar for me. This is in GIF format for presentation sake only, but perhaps I will end up using something more static because the quantity of information that'll be included on the timeline might make an animated timeline like this a bit cumbersome. Or I could only place select information on the timeline and allow the majority of information to be in a static format. The format that you see in the gift is, actual, is an actual photo of the Oakland Community School taken by one of the BPP photographers. <clears throat> Moving to the next slide, uh, mapping tool. Students in traditional school settings tend to stay in the classroom and near the school with the exception of sports. This was not the case for OCS. So I figured a mapping component is important because it will allow the motto, the school's motto, the world is a child's classroom to actually come alive. Years ago, I started tracking, keeping track of OCS related locations using Google Maps as I came across the information during research in organizational records, archival material, or even during interviews. That was helpful to me, not just in terms of my need to find locations when I traveled to the Bay Area, but also because I was able to visualize the space through which OCS children and teachers and parents, families moved. There's still so much for me to learn and try in terms of mapping tools. I wanna map events, field trips, the route students took to travel from wherever they lived in the Bay Area to OCS because no one was zoned to OCS. And I would like to use maps from the time period as well. The categories on this Google map are field trips and school band performance locations. Because of the size of the screen, I did not capture the Southern California field trips to Santa Monica and Watts. I'm not sure if we have any jazz enthusiasts in the audience, but for two years, the band instructor for OCS was avant-garde jazz drummer, trumpetist and educator, the late Charles Moffat. And it's been fascinating tracking the spaces through which the children and the band moved because of his various connections in the Bay Area music scene. Next slide, Tatiana. We've come full circle to where we started oral histories and documentary film interviews. If you recall, I mentioned earlier that the entire documentary history project grew out of a documentary film conversation. From the outset, I knew that after the documentary is complete, there will be a large amount of unused footage. And I knew the value of the information that the narrators are sharing. I couldn't imagine not being able to share more because my interviews range from a half hour to four hours. With so much rich history, that is part of those conversations. In fact, Digital Humanities is the ideal type of platform for this history because I am able to pair their interviews and narrative memories with images and other material that I'm uncovering and that people are sharing. And this, these, past couple of years have been so important and special for me because more of that visual material has come available. And what I think is um, really interesting for me as a trained historian is that um, when I start 
started doing oral history as an undergrad and even in grad school, I was cautioned that people's memories are faulty sometimes. So just, just really not to give up, not to, to, to assess a lot of weight to the oral, his, the oral narrative. And what has been absolutely amazing to me is that for years I've been listening to people tell their stories from their memories because party members often did not keep um, material due to the nature of just how they lived. And also um, people really just find it, I think people are beginning to find it okay to talk about having a connection to anything Black Panther Party related uh, without feeling like maybe a stigma might be attached to it. So now people are sharing this material and Tatiana can tell you the, the, the gazillion times I've emailed her, texted her to say, oh my God, I just found more photos and guess what's in there. What I'm finding is that these images capture those memories. And it's, I'm excited about this summer being able to just start the process of focusing in on matching the imagery with the oral interviews. So we've reached the end of the formal presentation, but I want to make sure I included this next photo of the 2013 OCS reunion at Diamond Park in Oakland, California. It was organized by former students and it hasn't been the only one. It's interesting to look at this photo and realize that it's not for junior high, high school or college. Instead, it's for an elementary school experience. It seems very rem reminiscent of a family reunion. Next year marks the 50th year of the school's move to 6118 East 14th Street, which is now actually called International Boulevard. And I hope to have platforms in place to assist in helping OCS participants find each other and reconnect. So um, with the last slide, the next is the last. Thank you for your attention and patience. I look forward to your questions, comments, and recommendations. And I'm curious to know what value you see in a platform like this and how you can imagine interacting with it. Because the beauty of it is because it's so new and just developing, I can work, I have a lot of space to kind of imagine and reimagine how things um, might work easiest um, or what's of most interest when it comes to the public use of this type of platform. And the final thing that I wanna say, which is really important is that um, I'm an independent scholar. And so as an independent scholar, I don't always have access to the same tools as academics who are engaged in projects involving digital humanities. My expenses are out of pocket. So I have to use tools to which I have access and that I can afford in my personal budget uh, up to now. So I've purchased hosting on the Reclaim hosting platform, which buys me access to some of those applications, but it's an option I would not have known about if I hadn't partnered with UC Irvine Humanity Center, where I have the opportunity to work with Tatiana, um, who's a member of the research cluster. Additionally, I'm able to afford design work because I work with my daughter who has her own media company and does branding and design and website building and such. Um, and just a quick note, the software that was used to do the demo work as well as the other hidden site that you haven't been able to see yet has been uh, Adobe After Effects, Adobe XD of course, Envato Effects, um, Elementor and WordPress. And I'm sure there are others I'm forgetting, but um, Anyway, thank you for your patience and your time. And I am looking forward to any questions or comments. Thank you, Angela. Um, that, was, that was great. Um, I want to now invite our moderator, UC Irvine PhD candidate in visual studies, Sam Carter, to moderate our Q&A session. 
feel free to add any questions and comments for our keynote speaker uh, to the Q&A. And Sam, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Tatiana. And thank you so much, Angela, for your wonderful presentation. Um, everyone is welcome to submit questions through Q&A, um, and I will read those as they come in. But to start, I have um, a few questions, but I don't want to be greedy. So let's start with the audience. Um, thank you so much. This is an incredible labor of love. I was wondering if you might also be collecting curriculum from the teachers in this digital yearbook. I could imagine this being a, wonder, a powerful pedagogical tool for educators. Any thoughts on that, Angela? Yes, and yes. Um, so yes, I am. Um, it's, um, it's evolving. It's an evolutionary process, right? So when the Dr. Huey P. Newton Foundation in, I want to say it was 1960, 1996, um, when they sold uh, the material to Stanford that was in the basement of Huey Newton's home, when they sold it, um, I had a chance to look at it and it included a lot of material about Huey and his trials and his books and, and it included party records as well. And a part of that, and, and these are incomplete. So when I say included party records, maybe we had a half of a year of um, weekly meeting minutes from the OCS administration meetings, right? And then we skipped a couple months or we skipped a year and then we had more. So scattered, but included were um, photos of children at the school. Um, the curriculum, two versions of the curriculum. So they actually copyrighted a curriculum. Um, and I think the first was copyrighted in 1976. Um, so they had been at that location since 73, but think about the fact that it's not a traditional school and think about what Kath, what um, Carol Granison said in her interview. They were not educators. They had to bring in educators and educators were extremely interested. Ace, Dr. Asa Hilliard uh, from San Francisco State Ed School. Um, he was one of their advisors. A couple other people from UC schools um, advised. And so there are two versions of the curriculum, which are very similar, that are actually at Stanford. And you can log, you can, you can um, go to the special collections online and see it, the guide to the Black Panther collection. It's called the Dr. Huey P. Newton Foundation Collection. Within that is information about OCS. What else is interesting is that um, as I interview people, teachers, students, I'm learning that most people didn't keep a lot of material. But when I interviewed Chris Doherty, um, he's a white teacher, he was a, he was a white science teacher. And I, and I only bring that out because the majority of people who taught at OCS um, as teachers were African-American, but I wanted to point out that there were also Japanese-American teachers there. There were white teachers there, a variety. He did an interview with me. And at the end of the interview, um, he said, excuse me, I'll be right back. He came from his office. I went to his work site in Austin, interviewed him there. He came back with these two brown binders, thick binders. He had kept, he taught at the school for, I want to say Chris was there for six, five years, five or six years. He kept the binders with him all that time. His, so he has samples of student work in addition to the curriculum. He helped write the science curriculum. Um, and so yes, I am collecting everything that I can, but unfortunately, most people haven't held on to that. Um, and a lot of it, it's just because you would, you would be surprised when I tell you 
that I sometimes contact people and, and they ask me if I'm sure I want to interview them because they don't really have anything to say or much to say. So I'm collecting and um, I will include that as a part of the platform because uh, if you notice, I led my talk with talking about my educational experience because I think it's important for us to realize that there is a lot that's unspoken in the way we are educated. And so what I like to do with the platform and the project is have that space where we can actually not only learn the history behind how OCS students were educated, but where we can actually use it as a space to reflect on how we were educated and, and especially given all that was uncovered during the pandemic in terms of youth and educational experiences, we need to be having those um, sometimes hard conversations about education. And so, yeah, excuse me, yes, I do plan to have that, always have that as a component of the research platform. Thank you so much. Uh, we have some comments. I'm gonna mix it up between comments and questions. Uh, a comment from Susan Anderson. Gail Dick Dixon is my cousin and she is still active as an artist in the Bay Area. I commissioned a work from her when I was director at the African American Museum and Library at Oakland. So I just wanna share that and give you an opportunity to react or, or connect. So nice to meet you, Susan. Yes, um, Gail and I are actually, we're, we're pretty close. Um, Gail will actually be on a panel next week um, that Tatiana will probably mention it at the end, but um, the research cluster along with the Humanity Center and UCI Libraries is actually hosting um, an event called Art Power Community. And it's a retrospective photo exhibit that will be in person and virtual. Um, and Asali, I call, I refer to her as Asali, that's just because how I knew her through the material I found before I actually found her and met her in person. But she's gonna be on a panel with John Creer, one of the photographers, um, talking about their experience and their perspective on art and how it's relevant, how it was relevant to um, movements then and now. Um, and um, I just thank you for letting me know that there was a connection there. Great. So I want to read a comment slash question that echoes a question that I had uh, as well. So this is from Jasmine Young. Thank you so much for your presentation. My digital project focuses on preserving Black power oral histories, such as the ones you're doing, and from participants in various Black power organizations. As you mentioned, the stigmatization and romanticization of Black Power activists and BPP members in particular makes this endeavor difficult, but extremely necessary. So thank you so much for the work you're doing. Can you talk about the benefits of being an independent scholar doing this work? And I might extend that in general to, can you just speak on being an independent scholar versus a traditional scholar, your thoughts on, on that experience? That's a whole presentation in and of itself. And I say that because like I mentioned earlier, I've been doing this since um, 2000. Um, I wanna say that I didn't, um, I wasn't an independent scholar intentionally. Um, there were some health issues that I had that required me to make some tough decisions during grad school. Um, and so um, what I did know is that I had promised the women, it was at the time, it was the research on the women, I had promised the women that I would tell their stories because they sat and they shared those with me um, during interviews. And so um, I had always thought, oh, I'm gonna publish a book and that's gonna fulfill that promise to get those voices out there 
And it didn't work that way for me. And I struggled with that for a very long time. Um, and I was really, I, I probably went through some depression about it for a long time. I don't know, but I had a family, so I had to keep moving, but I also was a promise keeper. So I promised myself that I would continue to work, to do the work um, until I was in that space where I could afford to be able to get those stories and that visibility out there. Um, so fast forward to a lot of ups and downs, but a lot of support from friends in, um, in academia who valued my work and valued my voice and wanted to make sure that it didn't get lost. I was blessed with um, a village of people who would invite me to present my research on a panel with them. They were co-author with me. We formed the, the collective digital project. Um, and I am forever grateful because the advantages of of course, being affiliated with an institution is resources. The resources are so expensive when you're doing when you're doing the work on your own. But at the same time, um, I don't know that I I would have done it any differently because I think as an independent scholar, I I I was I worked um, at my own momentum and my own pace and. I, yeah, maybe had to do, you know, work stoppage because, you know, I have three children. I've had three children along the way and I homeschooled them because OCS gave me the courage to be able to, you know, the confidence to know that I can educate my children and they don't have to be at the grade, in the grade system, but according to ability, right? Um, there was a lot that I was doing in between, but I was able to kind of hyper-focus on what it was I wanted to focus on. And so um, I don't know, I don't know. I'm super grateful that I actually have, am now receiving funding this year through the, o, the OHA NEH fellowship that I have for the year um, because it's an expensive, project, right? Um, working with my daughter and her media company has helped because um, I've actually learned editing, photography skills, like so much of what I do, I've learned it through working with her and her media company. So I'm able to do, and we're able to do a lot of that work on our own, but they're just resources that um, I need access to. And what I'm also grateful about is that with UC Irvine, they formed a community partnership with me through the Humanity Center, because what that did was it actually jump-started the project again. It had been a little stagnant because I was able to have students work with me. And so, that process of working with students and other faculty, it, it's, it can't be replaced. I mean, there's something so special about that. So for me, I'm still kind of figuring out what it means to be an independent scholar, but I do appreciate that this year I have funding so I really can zoom in and just focus because it's hard trying to balance work life and academic interest. My husband actually asked me at one point, because we moved from the States in 99 to Germany for three years, and then back stateside and all around. And he, and he asked me, because he's not an academic at all, he asked me, when is it that I'm going to have to stop carrying around all these boxes and these file cabinets? And I said, it won't happen until those stories are told. So in my garage now, we, we're settled in a place, but in my garage now are files from when I was an undergrad and in grad school and transcripts and because it's you just it's a it's a it's a toss-up it, it really depends I think on where you are in life 
Beautiful. That's so inspiring to hear you be transparent and honest and vulnerable about like living life and doing research that you are committed to, you know. Um, So I think that we have time for one more question, though there are some wonderful questions here in the chat. So I'm going to see if I can capture those somehow um, for the future or for future engagement. But I'll wrap up with this question because I think it really beautifully connects uh, yesterday's um, talk to today's. This is from Utitafon uh, Inyang, excuse my pronunciation, but thank you for your comment and question. Thanks for sharing your incredible project In working with memory, oral history, and other kinds of incomplete materials, to what extent would you consider critical fabulation and other forms of narrative imagining relevant to filling in the blanks in these kinds of digital history projects? I'm going to be absolutely transparent here and say that I actually don't understand that question because I'm not in traditional academia. So I don't think in terms of theory around narrative and memory. So maybe if you restate the question for me, I can kind of speak to it. But that's one of the the things, again, about being an independent scholar is there are conversations that happen that you may or may not be able to engage with because you're over here doing these particular things. Absolutely. I wonder if it's, I want to open this space in case it's possible for clarification uh, or for this person to clarify. If not, then I will check in. Oh, yes. Okay, great. Yes. Okay. Um, Do you, I think you can do voice. Am I wrong to assume that? I'm not sure. Or you maybe clarify in the chat if not. Oh, oh, perfect. Okay. Hello, thank you very much for such a a very inspiring uh, presentation. The shared persistence and doggedness, I'm just so so happy to have listened to you. I carry around files too, and I kept wondering, what's this going to be for? So listening to you, I'm like, okay, don't figure it out yet. It will come to you while you're carrying this around. But uh, talking about critical fabulation, so this... um, tendency among scholars more and more to be able to try to imagine. So you have bits and pieces of the story and then you're able to step back and say, how about if the missing piece went like this or like that? So that attempts to imagine the possible aspects of the blanks that you do not have the exact details, but you can more or less because you are immersed in the context, think through and suggest possible options in order to have a more fuller picture. That's that's what I'm thinking about as um, uh, critical uh, uh, fabulation. This is, like you said, it's a theory out there about what scholars have been doing with works related to issues like slavery and the rest where you do not have accurate information. And the reason why I ask from this, I come from a very dominantly oral history kind of community where people remember things, but memory fails at times. And if you're trying to kind of walk through those kind of contexts, you'll be forced to quote and unquote again, fill in the blanks. But I was wondering whether to what extent that plays out in your work, if it's necessary, and if so, how would digital humanities help us to inscribe those kinds of absences? Thank you again so much for your work. And thank you so much. for taking the time to explain that. Um, I see Sam, to style of creatives, attempts to bring the suppressed voices of the past to the surface by means of hard research and scattered facts. So I I'm not sure, I will say I'm not sure that I've I've reached that stage in my work. And I think it's because I've 
been focusing um, so much on um, gathering documents. And so for example, I knew there were Black Panther Party photographers who had captured um, particular events. And um, it wasn't that I felt like the, 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 the narrators were maybe not remembering it correctly. Um, I think that my interest was always in going through what I had and looking at photos. And I knew this, a particular person who had a lot of photos, um, you know, just hadn't gotten to a point yet of sharing. So I think for me, I, I feel like I'm not there yet because all that is so new with how I'm working through OCS history and it's so, at the same time that it's so new, I'm feeling like I'm being deluged with material right now. So I think maybe like given over this next year, once I've been able to sort through all that I do have, I might start wondering about, you know, how do I fill in the missing gaps? But that's actually not, I think for me, what's helped is knowing that there are photos and newspapers and those um, things that, those resources that are at the archives at Stanford, because it's, it feels like enough to me, right? So maybe, so I'll, I'll keep in mind what you're talking about and revisit that. But so far, I don't think I've, I've, um, I've really explored, you know, kind of the question of what's missing yet. So I don't know if that was helpful or not. 